way back. people on the fringes here at home that were tearing us apart from understanding our common values. That world may seem similar to you. Sound familiar? <laughs> and that's why the Aspen Institute today still has the same surety of purpose that I think it did 60 years ago when Walter Pepke founded it. Uh, when they founded the Aspen Institute, they did so based on the principle that if all of us deeply understood and appreciated the common values that we shared, we would be able to find common ground in facing both the global challenges and our domestic problems at home. They did that, first of all, by creating the great Aspen Seminar, which then, as it does now, begins with the great values of Plato, then Sophocles, Antigone, and brings it through Jefferson and Locke, and nowadays all the way through Gandhi and Martin Luther King, to understand the type of values that we as a civilization and we as people in the world, the humanistic values that make our societies strong and that help us in the global struggle. In doing so with that great seminar, they not only taught us to understand the great values, but they taught us something else, which was the notion of balance. It became clear at times when you take the Aspen Seminar that something like individual liberty and freedom might conflict with the good of the community or the most efficient way to run a community. And so you always had to balance those values. If there's one thing really missing in our world today and in our society today, it's an appreciation for that notion of balance that as Benjamin Franklin would say, compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies because they know how to balance and show respect for the different values that exist in our society. Nowadays, we try to keep that tradition here at the Aspen Institute and with all the institutions founded in Aspen 60 years ago with that Goethe Convocation. And we do so, first of all, by keeping true to the spirit of the Aspen Seminar, the Executive Seminar. I really do invite you, any of you who want to become more involved in the Aspen Institute, to take that week-long seminar, to understand the great writings, great thoughts, great ideas of our society. And if that intimidates you, the notion of the great books, I'll tell you the uh, little secret of what we call it on the inside which is the great paragraphs, because it is a bit distilled. You don't have to read every one of the books. But it's a wonderful experience, and it's a foundation for what we do at the Aspen Institute. But besides this great seminar program that we have, we've started some other things, including the Aspen Global Leaders Network. That network was founded 12 years ago as the Henry Crown Program. And many of you have met many of the Crown Fellows that have come through here. Many of them have gone on to greater things. Arne Duncan, now the Secretary of Education. But they've also each done a project. After they finish the Aspen Seminar, they do a couple of other seminars. They do bonding and leadership exercises. And they grab onto the notion of leadership based on values. And then they have to pay it forward. They have to do a project. They have to create things. And whether it's John Danner, who was just here at the Institute a couple of days ago, who created Rocket Ship Education and some of the great charter schools in this country, or people like Peter Ryling, who works at the Institute but helped form a replica of the Crown Program in, Af in Africa called the Africa Leadership Initiative. And that spawned an East Africa one. And now, because of that, because of this pay it forward tradition, we have programs, leadership programs, around the world with 1,200 people now, whether it's in South Africa, Mozambique, and Ghana, the newest one in the Middle East, done by a great woman named Shadia, who's from Lebanon, who was a Crown Fellow, 
and now she's created a replica of the Crown program that has Israelis, Palestinians, Lebanese, and Jordanians all working together in projects. Likewise, we've done it in specific fields, such as education or the environment. The Caddo Fellows, some of whom are still around because they had their first meeting uh, this past week, uh, work together in different ways to do environmental programs. But all of them have that guiding spirit that Pepka, Mortimer Adler, Hutchins, and others did 60 years ago, which is first understand the basic values, then understand how to balance them, and then understand how to apply them. That infuses to the 27 policy programs we have at the Aspen Institute. Those programs range from education environment to the Aspen Strategy Group, one of the oldest. Uh, used to be run by Dick Luger and Sam Nunn, which is how the Nunn-Luger Act on Nuclear Proliferation came about, now run by Joe Nye and Brent Scowcroft, looking at ways that we can rise above partisanship and help deal with the problems of the world today. But these programs are not just about talk, and one of the things we tried to do in the past six or seven years as we uh, reinvigorated the Institute is find ways to have talk lead to action. So in many of our programs, we try to apply the lessons that we've learned, and I'll take two examples. One of them is the Middle East and the uh, U.S.-Palestinian issues, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issues and the role the U.S. can play. Not only have we been working on that problem with our Middle East strategy group, but we helped create uh, the U.S.-Palestinian partnership that eventually created a small business loan fund to give loans of $50,000 to $500,000 to businessmen in the Palestinian territories, often in collaboration with Israeli and American business leaders, so there'd be joint ventures in technology, garment manufacturing, taxi cabs, building, making carpets, and pharmaceuticals, so that now almost $400 million of loan guarantees are available in the Palestinian territories. That's run by Bill Mayer, Burl Bernhardt, and others, Madeleine Albright. And when the previous administration wanted to do a uh, public-private partnership with the Palestinian and Israelis, they turned to the Aspen Institute, and Secretary Rice and President Bush created the U.S.-Palestinian partnership that was based at the Aspen Institute. As you know, with any new administration, it takes them a while to do the same thing as the previous administration, so for about six months we were in limbo, but some of you who were here earlier today at Steve Wick's talk show, uh, saw the picture of uh, Secretary Clinton as she met with myself and uh, Madeleine Albright to have what's called the Partnership for a New Beginning. It's basically the same thing we were doing in the previous administration, they just had to rename it and take six months to reconstitute it. But it does mean that we can take some of the values that were planted with the trees here 60 years ago and help apply them around the world. We hope to do that in many different ways, including with an ideas festival in Abu Dhabi, including with the Palestinian business uh, forum that we do each year in Bethlehem. All of these things are a way of saying you can take the values that are engaged in this great global struggle and apply them around the world. The other place where I was going to use, as, I want to use as an example where we turn thought into action is K through 12 education, something I believe very strongly is a need in this country. If we're going to be successful in the 21st century, as we were in the 20th, we're going to need an education system as good. In the 20th century, we had the world's best K through 12 education system. Now we're not the world's best. We have to get back there. And that will take a whole lot of new thinking of how we're going to do education in America. We've had quite a few education programs that have been run at the Aspen Institute, ranging from the urban superintendents meeting to the new young leadership program, as I say, part of the Global Leaders Network, uh, based on the Crown program, that was done by Kim Smith, who was a Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute, and she created the New Schools Leadership Program for young entrepreneurial educators. That program met uh, each year in its inaugural convening. It meets right next door in the Coke building. And four years ago, right after Hurricane Katrina, they were meeting, and I was there, and I said, well, if you're really serious about this, you're going to turn thought into action. 
you should get involved in New Orleans, which no longer has a school system after the hurricane, is about to reconstitute it. And if you're really serious, you'll move down there. And Sarah Usden, who was in that room, went down and started New Schools New Orleans. Matt Candler, who was in that room and who was an education fellow, moved with his pregnant wife down to New Orleans six months after the hurricane and started working with the new charter school group there. John Schnoor, who ran New Leaders New Schools, a principals group, moved down to New Orleans from that Coke building seminar room and opened a chapter of New Leaders for New Schools, which trains principals. And Kira Orange Jones went down to be the Teach for America leader. Uh, I'm involved with Teach for America. They had been involved in this program. They had 250 core members in New Orleans after the storm. We asked them if they wanted to stay and help reconstitute the school system. All of them did, and now there are 500 core members there. So with that group, all of which came out of a kernel of our leadership network for school entrepreneurs, they created a new school system in New Orleans, my hometown, in which more than 70% of the kids are now in charter schools, charter schools started by entrepreneurs and parents have choice. It's raised the reading and math scores by 20 points in the past two years, and it does show how new thinking and new types of leadership, thought leading to action, can have an impact on this world. And so in many ways, this is what I hope the legacy of the Pepka family and the Pepka tradition is, which is understanding the basic values, being engaged in the global struggle based on those values, but also putting those values into action. You know, there are two themes we try to do here at the Aspen Institute. One is leadership based on values. That comes through on every single one of our policy programs, but it's also something we try to do as we apply each of our things. Say, so you have to go out into this world and move, to use the phrase of Keith Berwick, from just being successful to being significant, to making a dent in the universe. And the other is tolerance based on respect and understanding of other people's ideals. And those are the two values that we keep fighting for here. One of the other things we have changed at the Aspen Institute is it used to be, especially 10, 12 years ago, a rather closed place where the Aspen Strategy Group, the education, the environment groups would meet behind closed doors and just uh, you know, try to do it off the record and quietly. We still have those. We still have very deep drill down sessions where people meet in 20 person conference rooms. But we also wanted to open it up because we believe that the spread of values, the meeting of people face to face, is another way to engage in this global struggle. And so we've taken each of our policy programs and urged them to create broader, more open forums. And that's where the Aspen Ideas Festival came about. Some of you will be here for that. It starts on July 5th. And each year, Kitty Boone and Elliot Gerson, the people who put it together, have a whole series of tracks on great ideas and ways they can be applied. But also, uh, on Tuesday, we have another big public forum uh, on security, American security and homeland security, beginning with Admiral Mullen, who, as you know, in the past two days has been in Afghanistan after the change in command there but is coming here and will be a speaker at the Institute and at our security forum uh, this coming week. Those are the type of things that you or anybody in the community should get involved in, come see, and I hope it will help deepen your appreciation for what can be done at the Institute. Likewise, thanks to Bonnie and Tom McCluskey, we try to do public speaker series, including uh, people from all walks of life who have been great leaders and will be on this great new stage uh, and at the Greenwald Pavilion over the course of the summer. And finally, I think July 25th, we have our Environment Forum. Once again, since I'm from the Gulf of Mexico area, I'm worried about the Gulf spill, but we have people ranging from Lisa Jackson, who's the Environmental Protection Agency Director, to Tom Donahue, who's the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Because people like that don't always speak together. They don't always try to find the common ground. But crises like the ones we face in energy and the environment should bring us back to the roots of finding common ground based on common values. And that Aspen Environment for, uh, Forum is also open to the public as well as to participants from around the world who become 
coming in for some of the smaller sessions. Why do we do that in the age of the internet? People say, well, with the internet and cable TV and everything else, people can get information, they can communicate, they can even connect with one another digitally. You don't need this type of thing. I actually believe that in the internet and digital age, there's even more of a need for face-to-face, in-the-flesh communications. Sometimes in the digital age, on the internet, where everybody's anonymous, people can go to the different cul-de-sacs uh, in which of the blogosphere, in which they only listen to people they agree with, where they stoke themselves up on the left or on the right or on different ends of the spectrum, hearing only the things they want to hear, flaming people who disagree with them. Likewise, whether it's a talk radio dial or cable TV spectrum, people congregate at their end, hearing the only the type of information they want to hear. Cass Sunstein, one of the great thinkers of the internet age has talked about how that leads to a cascading into extremism where people don't really see each other face to face. They don't actually share values. They just interact in the blogosphere going to get reinforced in their own opinions and anonymously making comments about people who disagree with them. So in this type of day and age, I think there's even more of a need for an ideas festival, an environment forum, a national security forum, for speaker series, for people to come to Aspen, for people to sit around a seminar room and engage face to face in the flesh so that they can understand and feel and empathize with the fact that there are certain shared values that have come to us from Plato and Sophocles and Jefferson and Gandhi and King. And when they do so, they will capture that notion of tolerance that is more than just tolerating somebody else, but understanding and respecting those values of other people and figuring out how you can make the balance right. How you can have fealty to the deep values of our tradition and yet still respect and understand people and form a balance of those values as we go in the struggle ahead. I often like to quote Ben Franklin on this, not just to sell copies of the paperback of my book. <laughs> but Benjamin Franklin, when he was at the Constitutional Convention, at one point they were tearing, the, you know, the founders were supposed to have been these great people, but they too got in arguments like sometimes happens in Aspen. You know, they were tearing each other apart on the big state, little state issue until Ben Franklin said, when we were young tradesmen and we were trying to get a joint of wood and had to put it together and it didn't quite fit, we'd take a little from one side and then shave a little from the other until we had a joint that would hold together for centuries. And so too we here at this convention must each part with some of our demands so we can find the common ground and common values that will make a constitution that will hold together for centuries. And since we're dedicating a new building and honoring the donors sitting up here who did it, I'll talk about his role in building committees and donations for building committees. Because during his lifetime, he donated to the building fund of each and every church and each and every meeting hall that was built in Philadelphia. And at one point, they were building a new meeting hall for itinerant preachers. He wrote the fundraising document, even better than the letter most of you got from Melba Buxbaum. And it said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to preach Islam to us and to teach us about Muhammad, we should offer a pulpit and we should listen, for we may learn and we might be able to find the common ground of values. And uh, on his deathbed, he was the largest individual contributor to the Mikvah Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. That was the type of leadership based on values and tolerance based on respect and understanding that the founders of this nation tried to instill more than 200 years ago. And that's exactly what the founders of this institute tried to instill 60 years ago. And that's what I hope, with the help of all of you, the Aspen Institute will be about now and 60 years from now. Thank you all very much.